let's talk about what's happening with climate. We have just seen Beryl do, she barreled through, and we saw some islands escape the, the worst of it. We saw some islands that looked utterly devastated, and we now have cities in this country uh, that are still dealing with the languishing impacts. Talk to us about the current state of climate, how the CARICOM community is navigating this moment, uh, and what the rest of us need to be aware of in, as it pertains to how the Caribbean indicates for us what is going to be happening climatically going forward. Well, maybe I'll start with the last question first. Um, in the Caribbean, uh, alongside other small island developing states globally um, and least developed countries, we're actually on the front lines of the impacts of um, a rapidly advancing climate crisis. Mm. And so what we see happening now is really as a result of man-made activity that has been happening you know since the industrial revolution um we say in the global climate process that we have an objective to limit the average increase in global warming to within one and a half degrees celsius above pre-industrial times mm. right now we are actually at about 1.3 degrees celsius above Jesus. average global temperatures as they stood in pre-industrial times and what that means is that we are rapidly advancing into a state of what the UN, the UN Secretary General has called climate chaos. Mm. Um, from what we know, climate impacts that we're seeing now um, are, well, it's a few things. They're happening a lot faster than we thought they would have. Right. So I never thought I've been involved in, in, you know, these discussions at the international level for about 15 years now. And I never thought that in my lifetime, I would see a hurricane behave in the way that Hurricane Beryl behaved, how mm -hmm. it developed. So we know, for example, that, you know, increasing carbon dioxide, methane and, you know, other greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere are causing seas to warm. So with the advancing sea surface temperatures, these temperatures are actually acting as a battery pack for tropical storms, which wow. normally come across the Atlantic, but they are supercharging these storms so that it is possible to have a tropical storm develop into a category five hurricane almost within 48 hours as one of the first storms of the season. So. Mm -hmm. Everything about the way that that hurricane behaved is unprecedented in the behavior of this type of extreme weather event, but it is also in line with what we understood years ago was possible as a result of advancing climate change. My God. What, what's troubling to me is that I, as I study history, the Industrial Revolution hit different regions of the globe at different times. Uh, we know that slave economy and, and the, 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 the labor that came out of, at least in this country, post-enslavement, prison industrial complex, sharecropping, we know that different countries experience much uh, greater advances in technology than others at, at different times. And that's something that's happened throughout history. But that leads me to an understanding that a lot of the countries that are experiencing the brunt of climate change are not necessarily the same countries that are contributing to the causes of climate change. And it, it has felt, I, I will be on, my mother's from Jamaica, I'm, I'm a little concerned about this and in some some ways that I know for many folk who are only rooted in this particular country, um, most recently, not in terms of ancestry, that, that it might feel a little distant, but it feels to me like the islands of Jamaica, uh, Barbados, the Bahamas, like it feels like these are countries that are now dealing with the, the horrific nature of what is happening climatically, but they are not the countries that are producing most of the climate change accelerants. That would be countries like the United States. How do you see that disparity? It may be that I'm completely off in my assessment. I, you're the expert here. What, what do you see? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There is uh, a principle that we speak to in the discussions referred to as historical responsibility. Mm. Um, and based on what we're seeing now, it's definitely being driven by emissions that were put into the atmosphere before any of the countries who are facing the worst impacts were developed in any type of way. We right. know for sure that man-made climate change is as a result of the actions of those countries that are already advanced, mm. right? Uh, that rich countries, essentially, countries that, you know, have um, had the opportunity to amass uh, their riches based on either 
you know, the plantation economy that then, you know, right. gave way to, to the type of, of capitalism that we see happening now. So definitely the countries that are bearing the brunt of the crisis are not the countries that would have caused the crisis. Mm. Um, so that's one aspect of it. But another aspect of it is that at this point in time, we all have some type of responsibility, but our mm. responsibilities are different. So for the countries who have benefited from the you know current global economic model that we have that is based on emissions, 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 uh, and sucking the life out of planet Earth, mm. <laughs> those countries literally <laughs> there is there is there is a moral responsibility mm. to take the lead in mitigating mitigating their emissions basically right. it's shifting away transitioning away phasing out of fossil fuels and those industries that rely on fossil fuel emissions and the production of fossil fuels and by the way that also includes war so hey, hey, say more about is, that please <laughs> say, say, more. There is, say more there is that responsibility no but we we, we do know we do know that the production of weapons is is you know uh, um definitely linked to producing emissions, releasing more emissions into the atmosphere. We do know that waging war actually contributes to the causes of climate change. It's it's there, it's documented, it's factual. So it's it's not just a question of economy. It's it's actually made way broader than that. Economy as the center yeah. of it. Yeah. But there are a lot of activities that are taking place globally that are contributing to this crisis. And we all have a responsibility, although different types of responsibilities to respond. How do island nations and and the how does the global south? Because I've seen a lot of commentary recently. The global south has had it. So we, they are tired of of the the sort of uh, overconsumption of goods, overconsumption of labor, overconsumption of people, overconsumption of freedom at the expense of the global south uh, that we see happening in the West, happening in European countries. And I think there has been a, a growing it, it, to the American ears. This might be a new conversation, but I think for folks outside of this country, there has been a growing conversation conversation about the disproportionate responsibility that is not taken on by the West, by the, the United States of America, one of the biggest contributors uh, to climate change and the, to the climate crises. How do you, how do we speak in terms of responsibility when the groups that are contributing the least, although we all bear that responsibility, are taking steps to be responsible, thinking about uh, alternative ways of production, thinking about being ha having uh, food production and agriculture more in alignment with sustainability and long-term growth and development, and yet the folks who are doing the most of the polluting are like, responsibility? I don't know her. Who is she? Who is responsibility? I don't know her. Who her dad? I don't know who she is. What are we supposed to do with that, Ruana? Come on now. Because you know what's happening. America's like, oh, you can take a responsibility. That's cute. That's adorable. Look at them. They're trying so hard. What are we supposed to do in that world? And this is where it comes down to, yeah, this is this is the hard, this is the hard question, right? Um, there's so many ways that you could look at it. Uh, I like to think about it uh, from through the lens of equity and what is equitable mm -hmm. uh, and also through the lens of vulnerability. So from an huh. equity standpoint, if you look at it um, at a nation state level, it's clearly, clearly, uh, there clearly, there's clearly a justice issue there, right? There's we refer to it as climate justice, although there are different aspects of climate justice. So there's clearly a justice issue where those countries that are the least responsible are bearing, you know, the brunt of the worst impacts at this point in time. At the end of the day, we all will have to face impacts, but those of us who are, you know, at the front have mm -hmm. to be dealing with it at this point in time. So there's yeah. that aspect of it. There's also the aspect of it that goes to looking at people and individuals and the fact that in any country, anywhere in the world where climate impacts are experienced, it will always be those individuals that are marginalized, mm -hmm. uh, those individuals that are more vulnerable, those individuals who are at the lower socioeconomic bracket, who will be the worst impacted, yeah. right? Yeah. And those two conceptions of equity sometimes collide. So in the in the example of a country like the United States where climate change is, you know, um a hot topic, it's a it's a political issue. Mm -hmm. Um uh, and it's it's used um you know it's used as a weapon usually in the context of any election discussion. Mm -hmm. Um 
What is emphasized there would be the fact that climate action by the U.S. may disadvantage U.S. citizens, individuals. It's inequitable right. for the individual U.S. citizen. Um, this this focus on climate action because climate action is somehow ludicrously still seen as being, you know, um, a counterbalance to development, a threat to development. Mm. And how do we get through this? I think we get through this by focusing on focusing actually on a much more holistic notion of what we mean by development, focusing on the vulnerable everywhere and what it will take to collectively address injustice, to collectively lift people out of poverty. Because it is true that there is um, and there might be approaches to addressing climate change that will actually end up making the lives of individual people worse. And some of these people, mm -hmm. are some of the vulnerable that I speak about, there, there is a universe where that is possible. Of course, we know from the science that for the most part, it is very possible to take climate action, to design climate policy, right? that is consistent with the achievement of the global sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. And I'll probably end on this point by saying that it's not for nothing and it's not by chance that the biggest piece of climate legislation ever passed in the US is called the Inflation Reduction Act. Come on. It's Come not on. by that's right. You you got your you you were well trained at Georgetown. <laughs> you know exactly what it is. You know exactly. I didn't give y'all the rest of her bio and honorifics, but she's got all the receipts because you know we bring people here who understand the expertise, and and that's the part uh, that that final point I think is is really important. And and this idea of equity and the potential inconvenience of individuals in this country. Unfortunately, as I, I'm sure you well know, we have a real issue in this country when it comes to people realizing that equity might require them to consume less and and i always like to dispel this idea you know we have we have this whole line of thought in this country that says well you know if we're we're striving for equity then it's better for everybody well yes in the in the in the universal good sense but if i am someone who has been used to over consuming whether that over consumption is food clothing housing land i'm over consuming the ability to pollute then equity means i can no longer over consume so i have to scale back for me the traditional over consumer who has over benefited and has over consumed benefits from the harm that I have caused, yeah, there is going to be a harm. And that we get back to that phrase that says, when you are used to privilege, equality feels like oppression because your privilege is based on overconsumption. And that's one of the problems we're going to have to figure out here because we're in a real, I don't know where you're at physically right now, but we're in a real moment right now where conversations about equity are being replaced with conversations about a, a white Christian nationalist approach to governance, which will also, I think, spill into climate. We don't have a European understanding of Christianity that says mankind dominates the earth for nothing. And that dominance does not allow for living in harmony, uh, which is a real problem. Uh, Ruana, we're at the end of our time today. Will you come back? I have so many more questions about climate. And I, it's we want to always bring experts who are living the experience and understand it as opposed to just observing from ivory towers. So I do hope that we can get you to come back and talk with us more about CARICOM and the approach that the Caribbean islands are taking when it comes to climate. Um, and then I would just love to be in, in further conversation with you. So I, I hope you can come back. And I just yeah, want, sure. No problem. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. What's the best way for people to either follow you on social media? Are there any websites we should be highlighting for people? Because they're going to want to know what to do. Um, so if you can just give us quickly your, your the best way to connect with you via social media for the audience and maybe a step or two that we can take to, to make a, a better, a bigger impact on reducing the harm of climate change. I'll start with the last one first. Eat less meat which is the first oh. one. I'm not going to tell everybody you need to be vegan, but eat less meat, in particular, beef and red meat. Wow. The second thing you can do, educate yourself and vote accordingly. Hold your elected officials accountable for mm. what their stance is on this critical issue. It will affect all of us. It already is affecting all of us. Yeah. Um, if you want to follow me, you can at Ruana Haynes across, you know, uh, X formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, if people still use that. Uh, you can also follow my organization, Climate Analytics, at Climate Analytics Caribbean, uh, or at CA Latest uh, across all of those platforms, in including LinkedIn. Really, really appreciate you giving us some time and looking forward to uh, bringing you back to the show.